In our case, digital algorithms like those in social media enable us to enact incredible but often terrifying feats at scale. And so I'm grateful to have completed this research as part of the summer protocols. I led one of the 10 core research projects alongside another 33 researchers and that focused fully on the role of protocols shaping society, whether they're as simple as handshakes or as complex as zero knowledge blockchain software. This research uh, began as an nature of online swarms and calls more into that. So without further ado, um, let's uh, let's let's get into this. The research will be published in March of next year. So you guys are definitely getting a, a very early view. And I encourage all of you to go to summerprotocols.com uh, to sign up with your email because honestly the research that other folks have been doing has been absolutely excellent. Um, and you know Questions on the chat, trust that if you uh, don't have the opportunity to ask your question today, uh, happy to jam on Farcaster or via Telegram. So I grew up in Puerto Rico and we had a, we were surrounded by the mythos of the hurricanes in 1998. Specifically, when Hurricane George landed, I didn't understand, uh, being so young, the consequences of what a hurricane had. And I remember the sky actually turns lilac, as an omen of an encroaching, terrifying wind spirit that in Puerto Rico was traditionally known as huracán. Almost 20 years later, uh, at daybreak, it was actually 6.15 a.m., another hurricane hit. Um, this time I was living in London. And now infamous, the hurricane was a magnitude more dangerous. Uh, no one really could have imagined the, the, the damage that Maria, named after the Virgin Mary, would really bestow upon Puerto Rico. The official death toll of this. Rafa, sorry to what? cut you. Um, but those of us that are we're having a little bit of problems with the signal. Maybe you can turn off the, the camera to facilitate the bandwidth. Done. Um, Rafa, can you hear me? Yeah, one second. Okay. It, um, it is, just, so, just so you know, my megabytes per second are 870 megabytes per second. So not sure. Um, we can try it again. Yeah, it, it seems to be working fine now. Uh, at least the last bit was crystal clear. Got it. Um, so the death toll, the official death toll for this uh, was 64 originally. Um, but for us, this was likely not true because of the fact that the blackout for our family and friends was over three months. Um, the following year, we actually found out that the death toll was um, over 4,000. Um, it had been the strongest hurricane in about 100 years. And this number, 4,645, is actually now inscribed um, in our oral history, a constant reminder of what actual climate and nature uh, can do, its raw power. And a lot of the forgotten protocols of mutual aid in climate catastrophe were remembered or rediscovered, um, but at an extremely high cost. Now, during that hurricane, uh, the, the, the hurricane was not the only thing that was summoned at that point. Um, Jorge, a dear friend of mine, uh, he's Berlin-based, working in climate venture. 
He, like myself, was fidgeting on his phone, watching Facebook nervously as there was like a deafening silence from the people on the island. Um, one of the one of the things that one of the things that um, that actually happened was Jorge was able to uh, be able to start participating in Facebook and actually created a, a spreadsheet with mutual aid drop off points and connected with a lot of other people, including uh, Pablo Benson, one of his old acquaintances in New York. Uh, you know, we were not alone when we were online. We, the collective anxiety had actually transformed into a message of support. Let's, let's not delay, let's get supplies to those in need. Now, there was no banner or institution, uh, organizing institution. Um, there are visual memes like these that I'm showing that had lists of useful supplies. Jorge with his spreadsheet with Instagram and Facebook were actually sharing memes and mobilizing a team to address delivery logistics to be able to get mutual aid from all around uh, the US uh, to Puerto Rico and other places around the world. They formed cell-like teams independent of each other, but did the same. My father in Minneapolis, in near Minneapolis, uh, did a mutual aid drive to make sure the supplies were also shipped. There was a response that built a civilian supply chain. That digital diaspora had actually mobilized into a swarm and that we can consider this a network of people, content and bots that was continuously aligned through the algorithms that were governing Facebook's feed. It was unlikely, and one might say a bit unholy, but symbio symbi symbiotic alliance between social media and the Puerto Rican community because attention was all we needed. But it was not the presence of the protocols that we were doing, but actually the absence that gave them their advantage because while governmental agencies and aid organizations had to seek approvals and understand where the employees were that could that could do X or Y, online, we were able to permissionly, permissionlessly act freely, broadcast our intentions and coordinate. One, taking a step back, this is not unsimilar to other behaviors that we see online. Uh, there are animal aggregations such as fish shoals, which evade danger by being able to find dark waters as a collective, not individuals. And army ants actually build bridges over tricky terrains. Online swarms and, and that use the as algorithmic environments also create collective solutions, but they navigate the network world instead. And the hurricane response was building a bridge of information that enabled an individual supply chain to be able to take part. In this Next view, we can actually see a blueprint representation of crowd behavior in a plaza. These participants in a crowd gather organically, but also act collectively. We happen to see it whenever we go to a mall, whenever we go outside into a park. You can picture a crowd of people actually gathering at a sunny spot in the park, each individual person making their own decision to move around the park as if the crowd was actually collaborating or talking to each other, but they're not. The sun is actually serving as a shepherd. And for a swarm, an online swarm like Jorge and Pablo's, the algorithm is actually providing the sun and the individual comments which are existing. At the intersection of algorithmic navigation network crowds, swarms take on a gorilla-like gorilla -like traits. Jorge and Pablo had their own cell-like team. They used their infrastructure, in this case, social media, for communication and coordination. These groups are autonomous and self-contained, each within their own preferred protocols. And when we think about it, you know, what do all of these things have in common, these animal aggregations, these crowds, these guerrilla formations, is that they have a shared orientation. Or as Kia Crutler mentions in Artificial Memory and Orienting Infinity, a new essay as part of the Summer Protocols program, a situational awareness that arranges knowledge in a selective and associative manner towards a particular, particular direction. And we think, uh, when we think about that direction, we ask, okay, oriented towards what? The language that I've been able to discover throughout the research is this concept of a promise. As John Robb describes in Brave New War, 
the promise is a central connection between all the members in a guerrilla community. Each member having specific motivations may be substantially different from each other. In the case of warfare, these can be patriotism, they can be hatred, they can be ethnic bigotry, they can be religion, tribal loyalty, but it doesn't matter as long as they agree on the plausible promise that they're looking to achieve. It's important to understand, though, that the promise is not necessarily a quantifiable objective or even rational um, item. It's, a, it's less of a goal like build a boat or learn to fish. The promise is actually learn, let us yearn for the sea. In the case of Jorge and Pablo being able to think about the concept of what mutual aid, because the reality was that time was of the essence and aid was required immediately given the catastrophic nature of Hurricane Maria. The Hurricane Maria though is only one response, one, one example of a response in a swarm environment. There's a lot of other examples online. Some of you may recognize this graph. Um, this, this graph actually is from March of this year when a frenzy of panicked founders and, and CEOs messaged each other frantically because, fun, because the funding teams, such as Peter Thiel's found, Founders Fund, had advised them to withdraw money from the Silicon Valley Bank. The swarm had actually been summoned and triggered and the promise of saving your money, go, run now, get your money out of the bank, was so crystal clear that it activated the network and provided coordination where there was no organization to begin with. But swarms behave differently than what we've mentioned in terms of animal aggregation, crowds, and gorillas. First off, they navigate digital terrain not physical ones, location and mobilization is decoupled. And additionally, swarms, as we mentioned before, are deeply networked. Everyone can broadcast information or send instant messages to each other. In contrast, when we think about crowds, crowds are restricted by their physical environments and can only communicate with their nearest neighbors. They also have more than just people. People are contributing content, which may be autonomous or may have bots as a result of them. One particular example actually happened on TikTok. Some of you may recognize the doubloons. Um, in this specific situation, an unknown group of TikTok participants, likely in the millions, I don't know, I'm not 100% sure, started playing a game to collect imaginary coins. Now, anybody could participate in this game, um, social media users would browse videos and then you would come across a meme that said collect four doubloons or you've been robbed and you've lost all your doubloons. There are people saying you can buy, uh, you can buy a, a doubloon, you can buy a house or a boat um, to actually with X amount of doubloons. And there wasn't any software. There's no tracker. People would actually use their note apps in their phones to track their own doubloons so that they could participate in the game permissionlessly and then create memes. Now, over time, a lot of different rules emerged that different localities would adhere to because obviously, inevitably, you had a bit of an inflation problem with an imaginary coin. Swarms, at the end of the day, inherit properties from animals, crowds, and gorillas, but it's what happens when we are connected, interconnected, inside a networked and algorithmic ecosystem. Altogether, swarms are networks of people, content and bots that have a shared orientation that is strengthened by their ecosystem's algorithmic feedback loops towards a promise. You have a diverse set of participants and at the same time, those individuals have individual agency. They do not adhere to a collective we. They're constrained by their host platforms instead of the internal protocols because they do not have explicit internal protocols and they're ubiquitously digital. It's tempting to think that swarms may be solely a modern phenomenon, but unprotocolized collective action in networked environments can actually be found historically. One book, Outbreak, the Encyclopedia of Extraordinary Social Behavior, recommended by Toby Shore and from Other Internet, had a couple of different examples 
instances of what we might call protosorms. The tulip craze here is a good, a good example. Peter Garber, author of Famous First Bubbles, talks about these tulip markets consist of a collection of people without equity, making an ever-increasing number of quote-unquote million-dollar bets with one another with some knowledge that the state would not enforce their contracts. There was no more than a meaningless winter drinking game played by plague-ridden population that made use of the vibrant tulip market. Sounds a bit familiar. When we're inside a swarm, though, when we're inside of this environment or we're surrounded by it, it can feel often chaotic and we know that it leads often to shipwrecks. Swarms like hurricanes are gargantuan tempests, but they do have predictable life cycles. They do have predictable life cycles. Excuse me one second. They're fueled by natural feedback systems in their, uh, by natural feedback loops in their ecosystem. Like a hurricane, which has like, uh, where their feedback loop is based on the playful exchange between warm ocean water and moving air. And like hurricanes, swarms don't really have a beginning or an end. They have an emergence. When a hurricane lands, before a hurricane, there's a tropical storm. Before that, there's a tropical depression of wind and rain. And swarms are the same. Prior to Hurricane Maria, Jorge and Pablo's Facebook feed was already filled with the diaspora network, their post and latent energy. The founder network in the Silicon Valley Bank already had conversations that were popping up here and there. But it was only when the algorithm provided the acceleration process that the swarm coordination actually took place. That being said, compounding growth is not sustainable and eventually you do dissipate. Like hurricane swarms can only grow as long as the ecosystem supports their presence. Even if a hurricane doesn't hit a landmass or move to cooler waters, its mechanisms are self-limiting, a swarm the same way. Once you're dependent on the ecosystem you inhabit, if the algorithm sh shift focus, then the energy, the engagement that provides a coordination also dissipates. When Jorge went to Puerto Rico a few weeks after landfall, he was pretty amazed because the local aid centers were fully staffed and actually didn't need them. In many ways, the swarm's promise of aid and structure had already been achieved and the working group between Jorge and Pablo actually dissipated. Swarms can vary widely though in the amount of styles and emotions that they evoke. The collective behavior of participants can create distinct experiences. We've spoken about frenzies such as the Silicon Valley mobilizations, like the hurricane response. We might recognize the game of doubloons or the trends, the current thing from Twitter or cancellation raids, or maybe groups that are arguing in the replies of a specific forum environment, melees. And these patterns start to appear everywhere. You might recognize this picture from earlier this summer when the room temperature superconductor um, came to be. And this particular mobilization was surrounded by cheeky comments about people pivoting from crypto to AI to superconductors, meta commentary on the ephemeral nature of the swarm environments. Now, something in a fascinating turn of events though, swarms are not necessarily containing people. As Byung-Chul Han wisely calls out, physical objects which used to be mute are starting to talk. When soon, I would say, a lot of autonomous content that we're creating right now, a combination of media, video, images that are programmed to behave in specific way, it ways will create strange new winds. We've already actually experienced a proto uh, this type of people-less swarm. Some of you may recognize this graph, which on May 9th, 2010, the Dow, the Dow Jones Industrial uh, <clears throat> Average dropped over a thousand points, about 9%, recovering shortly thereafter. 
It was 36 minutes of a combination of high frequency trading bots and a complex interplay of different trading algorithms contributing to a rapid sell-off and rebound. Today, this is recognized as the flash crash. Now, this is a truly dark forest. Like there's a lot of stuff going, going on here, which often feel ghostly. <clears throat> when we start thinking about even the swarms that exist today, and even after they dissipate, the patterns of their behaviors persist in the data connections and network environments that we have today. Now they don't exist in isolation. As Maggie Appleton and Venkat may attest to, the internet is a wide variety of place which has a wide variety of different creatures today. And to best understand swarms, we need to understand the other the other types of the other types of collectives that exist. Here we have one of the maps from Venkat talking about the corporate web, the cozy web, email, and different types of environments. And it makes us wonder, okay, so if swarms are this type of organic coordination that happens from an algorithmic standpoint, what other collectives exist that we need to take into consideration? Actually, some of these may be quite well known. Many of us aren't familiar with probably the most infamous of these, which is called, which we called the mimetic tribe, a term coined by Peter Lindbergh. And this one is characterized by the creation and maintenance of cultural assets. Black Lives Matter, Me Too, Occupy, QAnon, Post Rats. These are often confused with swarms, but are different because they have stable influencers and a definite sense of in-group, as Peter Lindbergh might say. And to achieve this, a tribe, the mimetic tribe, develops its own cultural lore and assets. They have custom meme templates often, narratives, emojis, and bio, and a plurality of user-generated manifestos. Another one that may sound familiar, farming. Gold farming, social influence farming, crypto airdrop farms. These are different from swarms and mimetic tribes because they have distinct playbooks that they adhere to to extract value from the network ecosystem that they live in could be games, social media, or the stock market. They're quite common today. You know, you can go um, to um, Instagram and there's always these accounts offering you followers or saying you follow me and I follow you. With a stronger, as we start adding more and more protocols, so cultural assets, playbooks, um, we start coming into the concept of online communities. These, the probably the most famous of them, fandoms online. They have cultural assets, but their distinguishing factor is the fact that they have a digital home, a locality that spans both the virtual and physical worlds of their users, whether this be a mental space or an actual gathering space. They have prolific contributions to online lore in the form of fan fiction, wikis, and public feuds. They have knowledge hubs influencer networks with ranking systems and who's who and who needs whose approval, moderators, even reaching rough consensus on the type of internal governance that they might have. And eventually, online communities, if you begin encoding enough social protocols, you end up looking like this. This is a blueprint of the MakerDAO protocol. The fourth archetype to complete the group, virtual organizations. Blockchain organizations, known as DAOs, they can be considered the natural progression of online communities that are adhering to specific protocols. They have cultural assets, knowledge hubs, but they go further. They enforce their social and technical protocols via code. They have an internal reputation scoring system, budget distribution, funding, democratic governance models that are clearly demarcated and encoded. In many ways, these internal, these internal infrastructures then allow the virtual organizations to exist across platforms instead of within them, while swarms are captured by the platforms and algorithms that they participate in, virtual organizations 
have their own infrastructure inevitably. But the benefits have their own costs, of course. Maintaining software and coded social protocols can be expensive and risky. You need people, engineers. You need maintainers and operators. The total landscape can be seen here. Swarms, mimetic tribes of cultural assets, farms with tactical playbooks, online communities with their digital homes and virtual organizations with their software contracts. While, some, while the swarms rely on algorithms of their ecosystem to coordinate, one thing that's quite interesting is that the online collectives begin encoding their emerging protocols and cultural assets into processes. And even in traditional organizations like companies, these established protocols are in place to support their, their purpose and in turn shape the cultural and operational structures. In other words, structure follows protocol. And through protocols, we can actually transform one organization into another. We can look at the transformation from a swarm into a mimetic tribe by looking at how implicit protocols that are enforced by behavior became, become explicit protocols. Here you can see Michael Saylor and the symbols which, be, which they've adapted adopted to convert something that was traditionally just a group of people with no exact name into a cult-like environment. The power of these swarms and collective entities, these online formations, are well recognized. It is not a surprise that there are companies <clears throat> that are investing private and public entities a lot to get the right content to the right set of people so they can hopefully summon the right swarm with the right consequences. Because those that can harness this influence at scale, the power of a network crowd of content and people is pretty sure to reap the benefits, even if the externalities of this mobilization may be costly for many. A lot of social media platforms have also illustrated an attempt to control not just the swarms, but also external parties attempting to build swarms on their platforms. You have global content moderation policies, know your customer profiles, but the effectiveness of this remains slightly elusive. And we know that they can have severe consequences for the moderators themselves who participate in this process. At the end of the day, hurting shadows is no easy feat. If you think about a swarm without a constraining geography, without a persistent name, without internal protocols to target, it's virtually impossible to communicate with or hold them accountable. Like an insurgency, even if their promise is not negative or intentionally destructive, there's no single person or small group in charge that can change the weather. So they require us to take a new approach. Our ability to summon, steer, and protect swarms will depend on how we can actually catalyze, shape, and preserve network structures and orientations. Moderation has become increasingly sophisticated as a result of, this, of these intentions. In 2018, Facebook introduces dangerous organizations and individuals policy. It states how Facebook will be managing networks, not just individual pieces of content. Quote, under this policy, we designate individuals, organizations, and networks of people. But the challenge persists. How do you wrangle billions of people, content, and bots across hundreds of moving legal entities? And how do you do this supporting a plurality of beliefs and ethics and addressing private interests at the same time? Moderation and KYC are what I would coin as a new emerging set of alignment technologies. Rather than telling participants how to act, allocating resources based on forecasts or drawing out resources based on need, alignment technologies craft network structures and orientations. They're concerned with questions like who can participate in the network? How should this network react? How should it scale? What is the network's focus and promise? In other words, they govern how networks like Swarms can emerge, expand, morph, and dissipate. 
And a key consideration though, comes into the ecosystem intentions. Moderation, top-down moderation, and the way that's centrally managed is often a technology of assimilation where we're adjusting networks and orientations towards a central entity's objective. They make sure that our, that Facebook advertisements appear alongside brand approved content, avoiding placement alongside unsuitable or unseemly ones. We are thinking like shepherds, like farmers, seeking to control the raw resource of focus and attention, herding it to our preferences and needs. But we do have to ask her question, what would it look like to be gardeners or foresters? Cultivating ecosystems for long-term sustainability, mutuality, and health. Reframing our intentions might actually provide a new path because we need to ask, do alignment technologies that we have today have to rely on assimilation to a central entity? Could it be possible to support attunement between the participants instead? As much as I critique Twitter or X nowadays, we do have to acknowledge changes to approaches in moderation and alignment technologies. Community Notes is one of these innovations. Here we have two advertisements which are being corrected by the community. As Twitter describes, contributors can leave notes on any post and if enough contributors from different points of view rate the note as helpful, the note will be publicly shown on the post. This means that posts have clarifying comments, central moderation is giving way to crowdsourced moderation. And attunement instead is about shaping the network structure and orientation to best achieve the goals of the network that's participating. This is a concept that we see in interpersonal dynamics and it originates from the child development research where we're describing our caregivers' ability to tune in to recognize and respond to children's needs and moods. It is a caregiving approach. And maybe, just maybe, we can find patterns of design where collectives can actually live in harmony as they carve out their own nook and build sustainable interdependent ecosystems, a place that's not based on fear-mongering, but of co-creation. For a long time, crowds have been the primary embodiment of collective action in the absence of explicit protocols, unruly physical testaments of public desire. And, but their momentum foreshadows what we might do, the creation of unions, civil rights movements, demanding peace in times of war, use it, but at the same time, they have also been used as kindling for opportunistic riots and mobs. Swarms have the same potential. It's why right now we have crowd control protocols and swarm control protocols are will follow soon. Today though, we live in a high bandwidth network, <clears throat> in high bandwidth networks alongside autonomous bots and content Swarms have inherited and amplified the power and responsibilities of crowds, and we're in the shadow of an eclipse where our virtual world is becoming the primary vessel for coordination and demonstration. We've already displayed the ability to deliver destructive and constructive consequences, mobilizing after catastrophic natural disasters, but also triggering international bank runs, creating global games, but also ruining careers. And we do all of this without explicit protocols planning or assigned leaders. The algorithm is enough. Swarms, like crowds, do not have to be destructive. They can be symbiotic allies, not just resources or adversaries. And so we are summoned to ask the question, what can we learn to address the global challenges we face today where swarms may be the key? to unleash a lot of our cooperative potential. So thank you guys. Thank you, Rafa. Really, really amazing presentation. Lots of, really lots of food for thought there. I'm gonna open it for questions and comments from everyone in the audience. Uh, so if you have something you'd like to share, feel free to 
in the reactions button at the moment, you can, uh, at the bottom, you can raise your hand if you just click on it, and then we can pass it on to you. In the meantime, as you guys think a little bit about things that you like to bring into the conversation, and just to emphasize, you don't necessarily need to ask questions. If you have your own reflections, your own insights, et cetera, feel free to bring it in. The more this is multi-sided, swarm-like conversation, uh, probably the more enjoyable it's gonna be for everyone. Um, so, but to kick it off, uh, I was feeling, I was thinking, Rafa, with the what you're bringing towards the the end of it uh, about the difference in between assimilation and attunement. That a key challenge for network participants in these swarms is the ability to handle complexity. Like corporations hide behind a simplifying single mission statement or single purpose statement, and that helps to align people and so on. In, in a swarm, like you were describing the Puerto Rican one, there is like a very clear goal is like, let's help these people. It's not very clearly defined, but at least directionally is very clear. Yeah. Um, and I guess in, I don't know, in other swarms or when you're relating more peer to peer, that becomes very complex. I'm curious if you have any thoughts around that. Yeah, I mean, I I think you're, I think you're right. I think um, some of the challenges that it's very difficult to get swarm momentum if you don't actually have clarity in terms of that promise. Now, crafting a compelling promise from a central perspective can actually be quite difficult. Most often than not, it has to do with like an emergent perspective. So if I was working with a team, um, one of the main things is you actually have to listen to why all the participants are actually like gathering in that space to begin with. It can be hard to tease out what that actual promise lo looks like. Um, one example right now is, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think we could end this presentation without um, thinking about the swarm like behavior, which is occurring around the Israel Palestine conflict or the Ukraine Russia conflict. And, we might ask what is the promise that's actually driving people towards that type of coordination or what coordination is happening. We know that algorithmic incentives are driving people together because of the engagement mechanism. Um, but I do think that it's hard to gather momentum and to drive change if there's not uh, necessarily clarity in terms of that promise. Hmm. So, on that, it seems that a lot of the the examples that you're mentioning, they these are relatively short-lived swarms. And we know by the behavior in social media, we have the flavor of the month. So before we have the Ukraine the war, no, no one is talking about it, right? And and it's it's anyway, uh, morally complex to to explore that. Um, but coming to swarms itself, it seems to me that swarming, swarming is kind of like a very high energy state. Uh, That's right. Like there's a lot of activity, but a lot of energy consumption as well. And so they tend to be short lived. That's right. Uh, and it's why a hurricane, right, is not persistent. It's the same thing. You have to consume the energy from some environment. And if you don't, have a constant level of attrition, so constantly new people coming in to driving the attention funnel, the, the swarm will dissipate. It doesn't necessarily die, and I think it's worthwhile to delve on that, which is the energy level goes up and down. And once your pattern of behavior is like set, so the algorithm knows that that pattern of behavior exists, they may be like resummoned the same way, kind of like a ghost is someone from, from the dead or from the afterlife. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And if from the Together Crew team who gave a presentation um, a few weeks ago was talking about, he's doing research on mm -hmm. organoids built with neurons. So they incubate neurons in a lab and put them in a, in a Petri dish and then start figuring out the electric patterns. And they were seeing that there is a few neurons, usually the initial ones, who tend to create more permanent roles while most of the other neurons take very ad hoc roles. And, and I guess we're seeing somewhat of a parallel here. But let me pass it on to Tivo and then Rafa, if you want to comment as well, Phil, pass yep. it on. I, I like this talk. I also added some points on the chat where I never really thought about like bots and content could be swarms and, yep. and like just add on to the recent activities uh, like that, that dissipation because 
Well, what we created in community several years ago was a swarm and we put a lot of thought into it. Okay, how do we make it grow and sustainable? And it was very high because hard because it did actually consume a lot of time. And you, like you said, you don't actually have like really a framework or a blueprint and they, everything is like self-emerging. Um, but interesting from that side is that it always kind of, I feel like it moves to different networks. So it, it starts from one place because people kind of have this promise, like you said, we didn't never really thought of it as a pro promise. We also thought, okay, this is a purpose which we are trying to find, like, okay, have a decentralized governance. But I think the promise is a better word because we all had like different um, views and, and purposes that kind of align with the same promise. On the other side, you said that we always have to orient, have the same orientation, although we had many several situations where the actually orientation was like, like different directions totally. And maybe that kind of caused a bit of a dissipation. And, uh, and then this form kind of lived on in different networks. And at some point they just come together again and share knowledge and then it kind of comes back together and then goes out and come back together in different places. Like waves, yeah. Um, and yeah. One of the things that I think is important is when a, when a swarm does emerge <clears throat> or you're able to summon one, something that's really powerful is asking the question, if you do want to transform or morph this into a more like structured environment, and that's where kind of like the transition to creating cultural assets, meme templates, like being able to create a knowledge hub or a home or, or what I usually call like a temple, right? A gathering space. Um, you need to be able to do that. Um, and that's actually, you know, that transformation process is a, uh, it's not easy because again, you got to like get everybody aligned to the same direction. And more often than not, you don't get an entire swarm, right? Which is high energy and chaotic. You actually just get a bit of a faction, right? Like you get a small piece that actually splits off and then starts creating their own nucleus of a mimetic tribe um, or a community and then begins like attracting and recruiting additional people. Mel? It, uh, thanks, Rafa. This is an incredible survey. Um, just I can't imagine what it took to pull this together. So just that off the bat. But I guess with a question in there um, just is. Uh, it sounds like in the, the way you define a swarm, um, you know, you discussed, uh, you know, a weather event, which, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's the swarm? Right. And I think it's, you know, water. It's, you know, um, it's the wind that pushes the water. It's the, you know, and it, you did a great job of kind of taking us through. It's a cycle and these are going to appear and disappear. Um, so it kind of gets me to a place of um, like swarm predictability, energy states, things like that. And it, it does get a little heavy um, with, is there a signal I can send into a group of humans that's going to reliably instigate a swarm behavior? Um, and the answer is, you know, we, we know this through history. If no, I'm in a, you know, move, you Right. Like a movie theater, I can't yell, you know, fire. Right. It's I, I'm saying it quietly now because it's so taboo. Right. That's and I think fine. that, um, you know, so I guess it, it gets me to these places because I think about this stuff a lot of am I pushing a population or am I trying to draw them towards <laughs> a, you know, an outcome? And it's a very different type of uh, sort of, you know, activity. And it, it gets me to these kind of binary sort of, um, you know, places. So I guess the question would be, in your view, um, is there are there sort of platonic forms of sort of organization that you're finding among different types of of uh, you know kind of groups um, other than humans? Because the human ones, I think, were kind of you know there's there's democracy and republic and like what else, right? There's a chain of democracies and republics, and that's kind of how we build, um, at least as I see it, uh, you know, in the decentralized fashion, or as we're finding in Web three, you know, that those kind of cycles. So. Um, because I do find that the the corollaries get me to really good outcomes when I turn it back on, you know, kind of the human sense. And I'm like, wow, um, it all does kind of come full circle in like a, a biomimicry sense. So it's like, you know, yeah. is there anything else that you found? Yeah, um, I think so. A couple of reactions. I think the the yelling fire in, in the movie theater is a great example of like, you know, if you want to rile up a crowd, right? When you yell fire, 
something special is happening, which is you're communicating to everyone at the same time, right? Um, if everybody was chattering very loudly and you yelled fire, people wouldn't be able to hear you. So you wouldn't be able to actually create that cascade, that momentum effect. And similarly, like in a swarm, um, there's kind of this, you need the algorithm to kind of be able to drive this forward. And um, something that we talked about during the research is the fact that, you know, the content and the bots are slightly different than humans because they might have reaction rules. Um, humans have more complex reaction rules, but they are really a bit deterministic today. They might not be in the future. I don't know what forms they're going to take. I think this is uh, something that's exciting about this research is, like you said, it kind of opens the door to a lot of questions around, you know, when we start thinking about digital uh, footprint of humans in, at, within and, and uh, enmeshed with content and bots, then suddenly a lot different forms of coordination seem to like pop up everywhere. Um, so no, I don't, I don't have much of a, much of an answer. Uh, but I do think that you're right, you know, and the sensitivity here is, is very real. Like there are signals that will trigger the stampede, um, for, for lack of a better word. And this gets us very close to other types of more dangerous topics, like, um, very directed propaganda. Um, especially in on-chain environments where your data is public and therefore you might be more vulnerable um, to propaganda. Um, and it also gets you to, uh, you know, uh, this concept of like digital warfare. Uh, if you can summon swarms, you can actually create chaos in the same way that attacking one country so that you create immigration pressure in another one actually affects regulation and affects kind of like warfare tactics. Um, it's very difficult when your nation is having internal cultural stressors because of large external populations participating in the same way in digital environments. If someone is able to actively summon swarms to disrupt nations, um, or disrupt other organizations, um, that's a very powerful tool. Hopefully, I think the intention of the research is that people who have more well-meaning intentions uh, can actually counterbalance um, the, those types of powers with much more positive actions. Yeah. It seems like a, a very, very interesting double-edged sword as we learn more about Our Swarm and how to enable Swarm. Strong. It's yeah. very sharp on both edges. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like hardcore, right? Like there is so much power in that state. And as well, like all the nervous systems, so everyone's super activated. So like right now, the Israeli-Palestine war is a fantastic example of that in, as far as an example, a very tragic one, of course, but is the information warfare is very, very sophisticated. And, and we've seen, for example, um, Israel using advertisements on Twitter uh, to, to, for example, rally up an emotional response. In many ways, they're trying to summon a swarm of support um, around the world um, to, to support their, their actions and their intentions. Now, one the other thing that I, that I would just mention in general is that Swarms are not the first collective entity that has actually emerged in human history. A similar conversation of this happened in the very late 19th century uh, when uh, Le Bon first spoke about crowds and their power and the ability to use crowd power, especially in the Roman, um, in, in, um, in, Ro in the Roman um uh, environment where we talk about public and the power of the public. And so this to me is another iteration. Again, history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, repeats itself, but it does rhyme. And what we're seeing, I think here is the next generation of collective power, which is emerging in digital environments. And similar to this, it would be a disservice to talk about swarms as just emotional and irrational collectives, the way that we talked about crowds at the beginning of their um, definition. 
we do need to simply recognize that they are powerful and that they behave with a different type of collective intelligence um, that we might be used to. Artem? Yes, um, thank you. Um, so I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure I have like, uh, like a formal question, but I, I'm just thinking about all this and I've been thinking about two different issues. The one of them, I think swarm uh, is based on stigmergy, right? Like when the parts of the swarms uh, send signals to each other, right? I think, yeah. right. I, I'm not sure I explained stigmergy in the, in the right way, but I, I know that swarms and stigmergy. Yeah, are it's like, like that's a, they're highly networked, right? So you're constantly yeah. signaling to everyone in the, in, in, in the hive or, or in the collective. Yeah. Yeah, and and basically, if that's the the like the the driver of a swarm or or like the 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 foundational like principle, how good is it in terms of long term uh, decision making? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think what we've seen is that swarms can can achieve things. Uh, what we potentially, what I didn't necessarily talk about is the fact that for every one that achieves something, there's probably a million that live and die in the blink of an eye, right? Um, the trend that starts and doesn't catch on. And so I don't think efficiency would be necessarily the word that I would describe swarms. And I don't know if effective would be the word either. And I think in a lot of ways, swarms sacrifice a pursuit of effectiveness and efficiency for the sake of like energy burst. It's like a very loud bang. And you kind of hope that it's like directed in the same, in the right, you know, the bazooka is, is like directed in the right direction, but you just have so many secondary consequences to this. Similar to a crowd, right? We have learned how to capture the power of a crowd for not just governmental like or politi political related entity, like political activities, but we've also learned how to use crowds for a rave or in a club, like those are crowds. And so swarms may lead to a very different type of innovation that we can't necessarily imagine because, you know, when people spoke about crowds in, the 19th century, they were probably not thinking about concerts the way that we envision them in the 21st century with 10,000 people or Burning Man, you know? And so the the we're very likely going to see a very novel approach of, again, not efficiency or effectiveness, but maybe a secret third thing, right, um, that, that swarms might unlock. Yeah, I'm sure. I have no doubt it can be very innovative. I just worry that maybe we need the specific kind of innovation to overcome meta crisis, you know, like climate crisis uh, or you know AI uh, alignment, <laughs> and for that maybe we might need long term uh, to make long term decisions or like have a really good strategy. And I'm also thinking about. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with John Alexander. He published a book called Citizens, and basically he's arguing that uh, like we need to make this like fundamental shift from consumer-centric culture to citizen-centric culture, or maybe citizen-centric governance, so that yeah, basically we would not like the society wouldn't be framed as a society of consumers. We need a site of citizens. And I'm wondering if swarms are compatible with that. Yeah, so I do. Whether the same person can be part of the swarm in a club or in his remote uh, workspace and be a citizen, uh, you know, yeah. as a citizen. <laughs> yeah. um, guys, I know we're over time. Um, I'll take one more question if anybody has uh, any, and then uh, we can call it a, call it an evening. Yeah, maybe a, a, a point here that I'm curious as well, what you're seeing is 
crowds have massively evolved technologically, right? Like from Roman crowds to Burning Man, that is like high tech enable crowd that becomes a lot more permanent, a lot more organized. And I imagine swarms fall, is starting to follow that pattern as well. We start to develop more tools for swarm coordination that might help them to preserve or those high energy states, or at least create a, a viable structure for a lower energy state over time. So yeah. I would definitely, like I would, given how popular this is becoming, I would definitely imagine more of that. And most of us here work enabling that kind of stuff anyway. Yeah. Um, and, and one thing, so reaction to that, um, you can actually read about how crowds are maintained and how crowds are maintained in a, in a set of energy without devolving into stampedes or chaos. And basic stuff, like making sure that there are exit ways, that there's bathrooms available, um, that they don't overheat. So there's like fans that are actually created. We're probably going to see a very similar type of like different types of technology exist for like swarms, um, which may look like how do we keep the fan, right? How do we keep the water warm so that it continues like engaging? How do we keep the attention of the algorithm on the swarm for another piece of it. Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, uh, Tevo, last question um, is where yeah. we're going. Um, what are the, through the research, did you come across like the main risks or like um, situations that accelerate dissipation of swarm and, and that could like then the network or swarm of people and not uh, the hurricanes and stuff. So, so your question is like, did we come across anything that kind of accelerated this emergence process? Uh, uh, and accelerates the dissipation process. Oh yeah. So, um, swarms by definition need to be networked. The easiest way to kill a swarm is to prevent people from communicating with each other. That's one example. If you shut up the broadcast, right, you don't allow me to communicate, like the swarm dissipates because you, you've cut off the energy source. That's one example. This is why nations shut off the internet, right? Um, because you can't have digital momentum if you don't have digital to begin with. Um, but dissipation doesn't need to happen just like that. There are other um, ways which if you change the focus of the algorithm, so you don't need to cut their communication, but you can you can kind of um, in introduce friction to the broadcasting process. Uh, so, you know, mute a specific word or deprioritize a specific comment that also does the same thing and dissipates it. At the end of the day, swarms are dependent on the ecosystem that they live in. So the fastest way to kill the swarm is to change the ecosystem rules so that the swarm can no longer actually gain momentum or participate.